In 2012, a team of British researchers asked the question, what would happen if we treated 20 people suffering from severe depression with magic mushrooms? It took them three years to get permission to find out. I've tried, I think, maybe six or eight different antidepressants and they've never worked. Maggie, I can't believe how patient she's been. Four years ago, I realised that I couldn't go on like this. You know, she didn't deserve that. I need to find a way to change. About 50% of people don't respond to antidepressants, and one in six of them go on to kill themselves. So we really should be exploring every other treatment available. With me, what I've always been desperate to do is to try and find a physical reason for feeling this way. Although I didn't want to take my life, I didn't want to wake up. I wanted to go to sleep, just not have to face it again. Depression's so prevalent, everyone's exposed to it. We're looking at giving psilocybin to patients with quite severe treatment-resistant major depression. So I don't think it's normal to feel the way I do, the anxiety, the fear, the terror, panic. If this is living, then it sucks. It really does. LSD was isolated by Stuhl and Hoffman in a Sandoz pharmaceutical company of Basel, Switzerland. The door swung wide open for research into the nature of the schizophrenic process and, in the largest sense, into the biochemistry of psychosis. Between 1950 and 1965, 40,000 patients were prescribed a psychedelic drug for neuroses, schizophrenia and psychopathy. These trials resulted in over 1,000 scientific papers you feel happy now? Oh. Is that a beautiful experience, would you say? I would say yes. When psychedelics became available to the wider public in the 1960s, dramatic changes in attitudes and behavior followed. This is one area where we cannot have budget cuts because we must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. In 1971, under pressure from President Nixon, the UN declared that all psychedelic drugs should be classified as Schedule One. One of the difficulties in terms of Schedule One drugs, including psilocybin, is that because they're in Schedule One, this has discouraged any research into the med medical value of that drug and there's been virtually nothing in the way of research uh, ever since the 1960s. With backing from the Medical Research Council, the team at Imperial College London are conducting the first ever clinical trial of psilocybin, the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. This isn't a job to rush if you think that somebody could have one of the most profound experiences of their whole lives in here. Ready for the music? That was taken, it was the winter of 2010, when it was really cold and we had a lot of snow. Is that a happy time? 
It was, yeah. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What's happening today? Going down to Imperial. Uh, it's actually Hammersmith Hospital. And um, tomorrow is the first dosing day. Can you put into words how important this is? <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's a tough one. Well, we woke up, Maggie got a call, was it? You got, got saying, a phone call at half past five. Saying that there was a flood, so... <laughs> Maggie put her wellingons on, I put my <laughs> waders on, and the kids were asleep upstairs, so we thought they'd probably safe. <laughs> we went into the kitchen for some reason. We came in the back door, your kitchen. There was a, a trickle in the, the kitchen. We just thought, oh, well, that's It's just, not much. It's just a bit of water, bit. We'll, be, we'll be fine. Then the next thing we knew that... It, when we came back a few hours later... Up to the step in there. How did that affect? you in the knowledge of the trial coming up? Um, well, at that point, I thought, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. But for me, it's the last chance, I think. This is it. You know, I don't think there's any other medicines. I've tried all these ones that's been made in a lab, and none have worked. You know, they've all had very short-term impacts, and then nothing. Over the past 30 years, I've had maybe 30 different types of medication, um, antidepressants. Some of them have worked for a short time, some have worked for a bit longer, but they all kind of tail off. Also had uh, ECT, had 23 um, sessions of that, which I've been told worked for period but then the effects you know wore off so I do feel like this trial is another kind of last chance to make any kind of change for me but I felt that before. Robin Carhart Harris is the trial lead and head of psychedelic research at Imperial College. I have suffered from clinical depression you know I've been through some dark times so I think that kind of thing helps you have sympathy for um, people who suffer from mood disorders in general. Psychedelics are, for me, easily the best tool that exists to study both the mind and the brain. I think it has the potential to, to revolutionise depression treatment, uh, if not psychiatry. Professor David Nutt, head of neuropsychopharmacology, will oversee the trial. This part of the brain is called the cortex. And in the cortex, you do your hearing and your seeing, etc. But also in this part of the cortex, particularly this bit here, goes from the front here to the back here, uh, there's the sense of self. It integrates what you can see and hear and with what you can think and feel. And serotonin is an important chemical in the brain. It's a fundamental neurotransmitter for regulating brain function, particularly in the emotional sphere. And what psilocybin and other plant products do is to stimulate those receptors. And by stimulating them, we can mimic serotonin in the brain and sometimes perhaps do more than serotonin is doing, because in some people, serotonin may not be working adequately. Um, 
I said to Yvonne, I was nervous. It was almost symbolic for me. It was like walking from one life into another. Sometimes you dig deep to be strong because you, you don't want to come across as sort of an emotional mess. I woke in the early hours and I was weeping um, and I don't know where it came from. Um, it's quite difficult. It's, it's quite tough. There are two doses. The first is simply to test the volunteers' tolerance to the drug and the treatment dose will follow a week later. Each trip lasts about six hours and a psychologist and psychiatrist are always in the room. The experience of taking the capsules is going to be very significant for him. He's never experienced anything like this at all in his life. And he's a scientist. He's someone that really enjoys kind of the predictability of testing hypotheses and problems that can be solved methodically. So this is a huge departure from that. I can remember being in the doctors and feeling absolutely ashamed of where I was. You know, I worked as a scientist and as a team leader, and out of the blue, I was told that I had to work in a procurement department. And this was pretty much my vision of hell, really. There was just this abyss that was in front of me. And I went to see the occupational health nurse. Before I knew it, I was in floods of tears. I just, just completely broke down. And she said to me, there's something seriously wrong here. And um, yeah, we're, we're what, 13 years down the road now? <laughs> Real laugh a minute type of guy. I have been thinking about it quite a lot this afternoon. I'm worried that he is so different that I take a long time to catch up and he loses patience with me. So, yeah, I'm. Um, I'm a bit concerned I'm going to get left behind. The, the, the thing. Very powerful, very powerful day. And that was that was two capsules. And next Wednesday there's five capsules. What are your thoughts about next Wednesday? They're probably more anxious, actually, if I'm honest, because of what came up today and that I know that could get amplified next Wednesday. So I think there's a battle there that's not that's not done yet. He was taken back to a very, very difficult memory, which he didn't think was a memory. It was a kind of a new experience that he was going through of having his mother on the one side and his father on the other and having to choose between them. And he went to be with the very calm, benevolent energy of his dad. Um, and he felt the presence of his dad there. He said he actually really kind of met his dad again and felt his dad wrapped around him. He could feel the, the knit of the cardigan that his dad used to wear. So that was a really difficult, but also very positive and powerful experience. It's a huge 
responsibility for you, this. Do you get sort of scared or nervous? I do. I think if you're giving a incredibly powerful uh, psychoactive drug to individuals who are especially vulnerable, you have to think about negative psychological responses, you have to think about anxiety, you have to think about fear and potential panic. Let's just carry on breathing naturally. And then I'd like you to imagine that you're lying down in a beautiful woodland. You're in a clearing. And the ground is covered with green moss, soft and springy. I think depression is a bit like an addict. You learn to hide it from people. I don't want to be near people when it happens. I don't want their sympathy. I don't even want their kindness. And they would literally go into the bedroom, close the curtains, put the lights off and just stay there. It is a big day, probably as big a day as our wedding day, maybe. Because this could be the start of a new life. Fingers crossed. <laughs> in mental health, you just have to go into an inpatient ward anywhere and realise that we need something new. So John and the other patients in the trial have got what's called treatment-resistant depression, um, which means they've tried three different types of treatment and nothing's worked. I think the name treatment-resistant depression is really a bad name because you can't say that John's depression is resistant to treatment, it's just that we haven't found the right treatments yet. How are you feeling today? Uh, all right. Uh, certainly more positive than I was before. Um, but uh, I definitely felt that there was something I couldn't achieve on the first dose. It felt like uh, I could identify there was a problem, but I couldn't quite, I couldn't quite grasp it or tackle it, you know? It's not like I'm feeling euphoria or high or happiness. Or, I just don't feel rubbish, you know? Uh, and so, if this is all it does, then that's fine. Um, but uh, hopefully it'll do more. I just really like to get to the bottom of it or have somebody help me get to the bottom of it. It's difficult to know what to expect. I sort of feel like I don't know him well enough as perhaps we should at this stage. So that doesn't feel ideal. Um, it's the low dose today. I, I, essentially, I, I know he'll be fine physically. So let's just go into it with the right attitude, really, um, and support him. <clears throat> We're ready to take captions now. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Is it possible to take Mark hasn't really revealed to us why he's depressed, and I don't think he knows. And now the taking of this drug is about trying to understand where this is coming from, what this block is. I can't pinpoint a date or an event that could possibly be the cause of it. Over all this time, I think it must be something biological. I don't expect a magic wand to go, Wow, you, you feel all of a sudden great and you're up for doing anything. Kind of what I do expect is just not to feel so cripplingly negative about everything that it infringes upon my daily life. Are you 
hopeful? I am hopeful for Mark because if I wasn't hopeful, um, that would be a problem in itself. I firmly believe that this drug is a route out of what can otherwise be an insoluble problem. The nature of the drug effects are that they induce a kind of malleability or plasticity, so like they free things up yeah. so that you can change, you know. I think what can be characteristic of depression is that there are things that aren't conscious mm. and you don't realise their contribution really to your state. Yeah. Well, that all makes you know, sense. Yeah. yeah. Relaxing yeah. an easy evening. If ever you're worried about anything or you just want to ask about anything, you can give me a call. Okay. There are 16 ways in which drugs can do harm to you or to society. There are nine ways they can harm the user, and those are the blue bars and the size of the red bar that will harm the drug to society. So alcohol is the most harmful drug in Europe and the UK, and the reason for that is the size of that red bar. It's not the most damaging drug to the user. Beyond to the right, then you have heroin and crack and, and methamphetamine. They have bigger blue bars. And the drugs that the media get hysterical about, they're on the right-hand side. They're ecstasy, LSD, magic mushrooms. They have virtually no harm to society and considerably less harm to the user than alcohol or tobacco. Making these drugs illegal stops people researching them. Even though the UN Convention say, oh, no, we're, we're perfectly happy for you to carry on researching them, you just have to comply with the regulations. No one has managed to get through those regulations to do a clinical trial of LSD in 50 years. Um, what do you think does have to happen in order for decriminalisation to happen in the UK? Like, is it with a politician or is it with the research, is it with the people? What, what has to happen is we've got to have a completely public debate and you've got to hold MPs up to account when they are either not discussing this or talking rubbish about it. And the media too, you know, when people are lying about the harms of drugs, you've got to challenge them all the time. Baroness Molly Meacher has spent 10 years as a crossbencher in the House of Lords, campaigning for the liberalisation of drug laws. UK governments tend to be very conservative on drug policy. Much more conservative than many Western European co countries and, of course, the vast majority of US states. And that's something to do with our media, I think. They've been very hostile to reform in this area, which is probably something to do with the conservatism of the British people. So where are we off to now? I'm going to go and uh, pick up the capsules. Uh, it's the second dose now, so uh, this is where things get even more interesting. Um, it's going to be quite a high dose, 25 milligrams. And why are they down here? Uh, it's a, hi, Matt. How's it going? You all right? Let's get the key out. For sure. Uh, so the drug has to be stored securely. Um, in order to do research with Schedule 1 drugs, we need a home office license, so it's stored in this secure area in a locked safe that's actually bolted to the wall. What exactly is this? This is psilocybin, so this is the psychoactive uh, ingredient in so-called magic mushrooms. How does that compare to a sort of recreational dose? It's quite a high dose actually, two and a half grams of mushroom material or you know, hundreds, a uh, couple of hundred uh, little Liberty Cap magic mushrooms. So anyone, you know, doing that, you, you'd consider it really taking quite a high dose. So, yeah, there's no messing about. So I'm ready for the exam. You can't go on living, like, you have done for the last 20 years because it doesn't get better, it does get worse. Yeah, when I think back to late November last year, that was about as bad as it had got. Uh, and that was, that, that's, that scared me.
but we're, we're beyond that. Um, I'm, I'm extremely lucky to be here. It's a bit showery today, isn't it? Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, it was lovely and blue, wasn't it? First thing. <laughs> Please go away. Please go away. Oh. Please go away. Oh God, no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no. 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 With Andy, if you asked him what had been making him struggle or depressed, he would say experiences with his work and not feeling good enough there. But that didn't even come into the sessions at all. And it was more about his early childhood experiences of suffering and pain. Wants he wants to get in. He wants to get in. Okay. What about letting it in? You, we're no. here with you, Andy. No, 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 no. 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 Okay. These kind of early childhood experiences will often be repressed. People can go through their whole lives without ever really facing those those demons. But it's not as if the demons, when they're pushed down, don't cause any suffering because they're there. It is so evil. Just let it be here and see what it's here to show you. Oh, knowing that you're safe. I really want to go away, I want to go away, I want to go away. Okay. Just a small improvement would be lovely. Just for him to feel differently about things and see the world through a different pair of eyes. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. You knew that <clears throat> this was this was the big ride. This was this is the one that changed changed things. And it's of course it is left lots and lots of questions, really. But those I think the answers of those will come out in a good time. Yeah. Dad was there. Good. Dad was there. Good. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. A couple of times actually. A couple of times it was there. Where it was headed, it was dangerous to me. It was a dangerous path. But uh, no, no, it's all, we're okay now. We're okay. You're okay. All is resolved. I could feel that he was suffering so much, but I could also feel that it was really important for him to be suffering. So I was kind of pleased in a weird way that he was going through it, thinking, yes, now we're getting to the stuff. You know, this is what's been causing you so much suffering. So we need to get it out. And he was really in a battle with a large, dark, evil force um, that he associated with his mum. Go away. Go away. You're not coming in. There was so much darkness and so much pain. There were moments of thinking, where's this going to go? How's it going to be by the end of the day? You know, is, what if this doesn't get resolved? There was a sense from the last session of his dad being kind of wonderful and his mum being kind of terrible and evil. <laughs> well done, Dad. Well, well done, Dad. Well done. What sort of evolved out of today was that it really doesn't matter if there was one person doing right 
the other one do it wrong. What actually matters at the end is resolution and love because that, that is the big thing that came out for me today is that the more you hate something, the more you feed it with that hate, the bigger it gets. And that's what's been going on. I've been feeding this thing. It's been consuming me. And now I've got to the realization that if I stop feeding it with hate, it evaporates, it goes away. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Of course it is. Are you out? And as soon as that realisation occurred, because I had the representation of my father and Vonnie and the boys on my chest, but I didn't have a representation of mum. So I took a picture and brought her in to that that union really at the end and we were we were kind of one again but one hell of a battle wouldn't I wouldn't want to do it again I've been the happiest ever in my life and I've been the most terrified in my life in the same day probably in the space of half an hour so good mm, really good Exhausting, but really, really very good. And I mean, well, the proof is in the pudding, you know. Today, today was good. It was intense, it was good, it was tough. All the things I hoped for. But we will see how Andy is feeling tomorrow, next week. And the really key thing is in a week, a month, a few months, that's what's really important. <sighs> Hi, uh, yeah, good to see you. How are you doing? All right. Good. Good. Yeah, we're all right. Yeah. 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 My mind's been racing about, you know, what could, what could be it, what could be this, or what could be that. And mm -hmm. Lots of different sort of nightmares about. You have had some. Oh yeah, yeah. But more about um, what it could be that's coming this time. You know. Yeah. I think we should get into the room uh, well ahead of time and settle down and we'll talk to the others. Mm -hmm. Last week we had somebody in the study who had a particularly strong response to psilocybin, probably the strongest psychedelic experience I've ever I've ever sat with. So that's kind of raised raised my kind of alertness really about today. It's just a reminder really never to underestimate the power really of, of, um, of a psychedelic drug and, and the alterations in consciousness that they can induce. Tell us what's on your mind. I don't know, it just feels like you're stopped. It feels like it, I just don't want to go home, that's all. I just want to go home? Yeah. How come? I, just, I don't know, it just, this isn't, I, I mean, did you really get Today, John nearly left, which was quite a dilemma for us because on the one hand, we wanted to keep him here and keep him safe, but we also didn't want to keep him here against his will, so it was difficult. It's probably a little bit early for you to go, is yeah. I mean, can you just hold on for a little bit longer? I don't know, I just want to go home, really. Yeah. So. Is there anything at all? There's just, like, well, when I close my eyes and try and, I, I, can, I try and sleep, I just go for like one sort of bad dream to the next. That sort of feels like. It wasn't really what I would have planned or expected. I didn't even realise that's what John needed, but looking back, I could see it was what he needed. It was like the first dose was like lulling him into it. It gave him a sense of, it's OK, I can do this. And then the second dose, it's like, right, now the real work begins. And the real work isn't experiencing some lovely feeling of love from the world. The work is going on a journey within yourself finding that nugget of pain and integrating it into your life. I'm really hoping and praying that it has 
worked. Up until now, um, with John being ill, I've been mum and dad to the kids. And now it might be that I can share the load again and it won't just be me, it'll be me and John together working as a team like we used to do all those years ago. Yeah. Oh, I nearly left. Why? It was just, uh, it, it got pretty horrible. Okay. And then uh, some very kind people convinced me to stay in the room. <laughs> Did they tie you down? No, no. It was just cool. Nearly. No physical restraint. <laughs> I think a lot's been sort of experienced today. Okay. And, um, been, um, yeah, I guess a little rockier than last time. Oh, yeah. yeah. At one point, but... I think maybe um, because of that, um, maybe you know, there's, there's more benefit to be had from this experience yeah. than us. Yeah, it was bad in terms of my experience, but necessary. Uh, for, Does it mean you're going to get rid of the beard? No, yeah. Oh. A man appeared to me and said, grow it till it's down to your knees. Oh. <laughs> At first, I really didn't think it was working. It wasn't until the very end when I could sit and then reflect on it that I could see what had happened. All these things that had happened to me when I was a kid, it made me face every single one of them. And nobody wants to do that. But yeah, so it was an extremely horrible uh, afternoon. The worst experience in my life. Sometimes through it, I could hear bugs, as if a bug was crawling through the ground. So the images that I saw was, was of this massive, sort of black and red iron thing with huge spikes pointing out at it. But the experience that it relates to was when some kids had took my T-shirt off and threw me into this massive patch of nettles. And I was beat with uh, hawthorn branches. Um, and the bugs that I heard were the bugs that I heard when I was on the ground afterwards crying. The sharp spikes on the big black and red thing were the thorns on the, the branch. It was almost like absolutely everything was trying its hardest to say, this is the problem, <laughs> you know. It makes me feel that um, depression is a, a way we cope. As a kid, we, we build up psychological protections for ourselves around about these events, right? But at some point in your adult life, we have to come to terms with that and, and deal with it. Um, and there is no natural part of life that we have in modern society that allows that to happen. Counselling doesn't do it, antidepressants won't do it. But this... Uh, this thing does do that. It takes you straight there, uh, exactly what Robin promised. It will take you to a dark place. Whatever the problem is, it will take you straight to that. And you have to decide there and then whether you're going to be a victim of that for the rest of your life or not. John. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, much better. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> What was astounding was it wasn't some external spiritual force or it wasn't someone's counselling technique. It's your own self that does the healing in the end. images you can see the cortex that's the outer part of the brain here and this is a kind of spine to the cortex and this seems to be particularly implicated in in depression now what psilocybin does is to introduce a degree of chaos if you want almost like a kind of scrambling effect mm -hmm. there's a kind of resetting of the brain and it and it sort of settles into this into a healthy uh, yeah. mo mode of function that's the reason for the difference. that's that's what we're doing now really yeah <clears throat> It's really interesting. <laughs> Tell us whether you'd have been able to walk around London a month ago. No, I wouldn't have done that. Coming into a place like London, like on Oxford Street and Regent Street, where it's so mobbed, 
I just wouldn't have done that. I'm enjoying it, you know, it's nice. There's, you're not sitting thinking about yourself or thinking about anything depressing or bad or dark or deep. It feels good, it feels there's like a lightness, you know. In fact, it, um, it is like a burden that's been lifted, that's what it feels like. It's if someone's just come along and uh, taken away everything that was weighing you down. Today I just really want to get it over and done with, basically. I don't really have any hopes or predictions or ideas about what might happen or really. Um, let's just get on with it, really, yeah. I feel really tired, hungover. Massively abnormal feelings for me that I'm not sure if I've ever experienced in my adult life. Do you feel like it's something that you want to work on? I... I kind of want to work on it because I don't want to feel like this or... Yeah, feel like this or how I've felt for the majority of my life anymore. There was nothing that link back to like this is what caused your depression you know use these tools and work it out now it's like it's still a massive mystery to me and is that disappointing it's no more disappointing than every other day so yeah Um, just trying to think. I know the first Christmas I had a red trike. So I'd got to be three and a half, I think. So it looked just, it's so much smaller than I remember. And you see the little window on the ground floor. Oh yeah. That's where I used to sit with Lynn on the stairs, listening to it all kick off in the lounge. Going into the treatment, I thought, is it going to be the sort of conflict I had at work or is it going to be the family? Strangely, I've not even thought much about what happened at work. Although it was momentous, you know, for me then, it's kind of, it's autom automatically sort of just drifted back to, to what went on in that house down there. That's, that's, that's where, that's where the damage was done. Just give me a minute down here. This is probably the third or fourth time we've been back as a couple to see where he's lived. And all he's ever done is remembered it with fondness. This was how, where I grew up and I loved this and I did this and I did this with Dad. And, and today it's just more painful. A change has occurred. There's no doubt about that. that a change has occurred. But it's not... <laughs> it's not the easy change that I thought it would be. 
it's a bit as though I had ingested a really, really good um, therapist. That's what, it, that's what it feels like. It feels as though I've got on board now <clears throat> my own therapist. Okay. Cheers. Thank you so much and thanks for everything. Really. I know it's work in progress, but you know, I think I think things are moving in the in the right direction. I'm not sure whether it's correct or not, but the way I look at it is that I've been unhappy for so long that I think that unhappiness has spilt obviously into my life and my relationships. And I think there's a residue that's got to be dealt with. But the other thing was this awful image that I had with the, uh, with the smothering. This, this, this awful image that, that... That your dad didn't want you, the rejection. Yeah, yeah. It was like a... Yeah. It was like a... God, it felt like a pillow over me. I could actually see the, the pillow and then suddenly the realisation was, you know, that I'm being smothered. feeling was real, then the realisation that it was Dad doing it was real. Did you? No. Did you really not want me that badly? All I can remember about my dad is good and that's why I think I can't ever imagine him you know, wanting to dispatch me with a pillow. So I've got lovely memories of getting up at sort of 4.30 in the morning and, and going on his milk round. You know, these crystal clear images of those times that are really pleasant. Your mind will allow you to remember those things, those positive memories. Yeah. Anything that is confusing or conflictual mm. might be something that you want to keep away from yeah. Your, yeah. your memories and your, your yeah. conscious mind. Yeah. OK. okay for you. Are we all in it? Do you Often in a psychedelic dose, the person will experience the same fragility, vulnerability, overwhelming horror as they did as a child. So I think that's what happened with Andy. He, he was stripped of his defences as an adult and taken back to that vulnerable place. What was real for Andy was his fear, a fear of annihilation and, and sense, a huge sense of rejection. And that, that theme of rejection is something that has plagued him his whole life. So that feels like it's really clinically significant. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. I wish that I would be able to work as his therapist and that it could be a, a longer course of treatment and that we could perhaps have another dosing and keep working on a process. Because then I really feel that huge breakthroughs could be made. I hope that from this, this dose, there will also be a significant improvement. But I think for kind of lifelong change, I feel that further therapy and further dosing sessions would probably be required. Finish. Yeah. Should we head out and yeah. One of my major problems is not his depression, but it's the fact that he doesn't know what he wants and he wants other people to sort of help him and to tell him sort of what to do. Um, we've, we really tried to encourage him to try and work out a little bit what he does want um, from life, but he, you know, he obviously, he's still you know, reports feeling quite lost. Um, and so it's a, it's a delicate balance really. But in, in the therapy, I think we'll be all about trying to get him to have a greater sense of himself and what he wants. So 
I think school's tough for everyone. You know, I used to go in the library and try and read about how to act in public, how to, and it just felt very, very alien, the whole, you know, the whole concept of people having girlfriends, people having lots of friends. Everyone was different, but I felt very removed from everyone. I went to the doctors. He said, go to Amsterdam. I was like, mate, I'm 14. You know, you're, this is, you know, this is 1984. You're telling me to go to Amsterdam. What, what are you expecting me to do there? Because um, all I knew about Amsterdam, well, clogs and Frank, prostitution and drugs. And it's, I didn't think he was telling me to go to the Anne Frank Museum. It was, and I thought, that's my, that's my GP. You know, I've been told by doctors, this is what it's going to be like. You know, nothing's going to change. You're going to be like this. And then you think, we start thinking, well, actually, what's the fucking point? Really? You know, thanks for that. The place where I grew up was this little village called Clareland. I can still see the field uh, and the Hawthorne sort of hedge where it all took place. I could, I could take you straight to the very place. And the thing was, it, it didn't happen that far from my home, but if I ever tried to complain about it to my mum, she would just go nuts and she would give me a good hammer. And then when Dad came home from work, he would come in, if, even if you were sleeping, you, you, would, you would get woken up and you'd be given another hammer, you know. That was, I think, when I really started having uh, Sort of emotional problems, I think, as a kid. Of course, when these things are experienced, they can't be unexperienced, can they? And the typical response is to try and forget them and yeah. try and repress them. Perhaps the healthiest way to um, live with them is to live with them consciously. Yeah, because you can't change the past. There's no sense of wanting revenge or uh, no sense of being really angry at those events or the people that, that did them. There's just this sense of um, that's who made me who I am, yeah. part of what made me who I am, you know. It does feel like there has been some kind of breakthrough. Yeah, it does feel like that. I feel enthusiastic to just go home and start getting on with things, yeah. you know. It's like a, just a desire to get up and get going now, you know, get up and get going. John, Maggie and their children are sharing a single room in a hotel while their home is being renovated after the flood. Hey, Neil. 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 Hey
I've been used to life on my own for so long. Apparently that if you take the full magic mushroom, you die within six days. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that you do need to remember is that there are some dangerous mushrooms that look just like it, so it's not a good idea to go out and pick them. The reason it works is because there's a bit of your brain sort of like along here in the middle, and then so when you've got depression, that, that bit, it sort of becomes really bogged down on negative things all the time. And so what the drug does is it it kind of shakes it all up and then lets it resettle in a different way. But the first time I took it, it, it felt quite nice. The second time when I took it, it was a much higher dose. And it was a, the most horrible thing that I've ever experienced. You know, like imagine a nightmare that lasts for six hours and doesn't stop. Yeah, that'd be quite scary. See, that's, yeah, and that's, that's the danger if you just decide you want to take it for fun. You don't know. I was lucky that I had doctors around about me who could make sure nothing bad would happen. Before the treatment, yeah, we did have a dad, but if we did see him, it wouldn't be for very long, it'd be like five or 10 minutes, and he would have to go back into his room because he'd have a sore head. Since the treatment, she's got much happier. Um, but we all have, to be honest. Um, she's managed to spend time with her husband. Like, Ruben's gone to sleepovers, and I've gone to sleepovers, and it's been mum and dad. They've been having movie nights, they've been sitting on the couch, they've had a couch each, falling asleep on the couch doing things that they used to do before they had kids, before dad had depression. It's me and my dad, dad again, and not the grumpy old fart in the corner. <laughs> Six months after the trial, the results are presented to the media. Control S, control S, control S. Set up a file, control S. Every time you change it, control S, right? Usually fine, it's the last minute. This is a celebration as well as a press conference. It's taken, taken four years to get here. Yeah. Taken four years to get here. And, and three of those years were kind of unnecessary. They're just ploughing through regulatory hurdles. But we did it. And so how important is today then? Today's the birth of a new era in the treatment of depression, I would say. It's the first depression trial with a psychedelic drug. So it is, it's landmark stuff. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the SMC uh, for this morning's briefing. Um, psilocybin, an option for treatment-resistant depression, um, to be published in Lancet Psychiatry. Embargo is 10:30 p.m. tomorrow. The average duration of the illness in this sample was 18 years. So many of the patients have had depression for actually most of their adult lives. Yet uh, eight of the 12 were essentially depression-free, one week post-treatment, and five remained depression-free, uh, three months post-treatment. You can see some relapse in some of the patients, so let's not get carried away. This isn't a magic cure. Even so, um, the effects at this stage do look promising. How would you envisage this being dosed? Would it be kind of a one-off treatment or would it be repeated? Well, I think that's what we need to find out. The key question is what to do with the people who got an initial benefit and then it starts to wane. So we're thinking about trying to set up what you might call a kind of uh, more naturalistic study. So perhaps that those people could then be redosed every three months and just see if the, if the effect came back. I mean, uh, it, it might, it might not. Depressed people have a view of the world, which is that the world is a nasty, hostile place. And of course, they're right, because it is. But after psilocybin, the depressed people tended to view the world the same way as we do, which is it's, it's better than it is. And that's a great defense. Yeah. What would be the process for a drug like psilocybin to move from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2? What are the sort of reasons that it isn't happening? Yeah, I, I would say a major reason is because of the United Nations conventions and the schedules under those conventions um, that a country like the UK tends to follow. 
And that, those conventions very clearly includes psilocybin within Schedule 1. So to, to move against the UN conventions, you really need some strong evidence. So it's a sort of chicken and egg situation. If psilocybin were put into Schedule 2, this would make it much easier for researchers to get hold of it, to get a license. You know, the whole thing would be freed up. You'd then have lots of research. And, and if it showed that psilocybin really helped people with depression, you'd get change. But getting that research to happen while these drugs are in Schedule 1 is very difficult. Do you have any regrets about doing the trial? I suppose really only in that what it revealed to me. I think with a high dose, um, the experiences were, were profound and pretty dark. It introduced me to the fact that something really nasty could have happened in my childhood and you can't kind of unthink that but it kind of leaves you with the feeling of well was that the case did it you know was i was i smothered as an infant there's two sides i suppose that you say well if i'd not learned that then maybe the recovery process wouldn't wouldn't be working hasn't worked or does knowing it actually make the whole situation worse but yeah i'd do it again you know that's it introduces you to a possible solution for depression it was a little bit empowering it it made me think, well, perhaps I'm not just a, like a passenger on this bloody, you know, merry-go-round. It might be that I can actually do something about it. There could be a whole new way of accessing the, the subconscious, the psyche, whatever, whatever it is. Mm. Right. Life with John is pretty much like it was before the trial. Crap, putting it bluntly. I hoped that the results from the trial would last forever because it was, it was so nice. The kids had their dad back, and to a certain extent, I had my husband back, and it's gone again. It's just, it's all gone. Oh, that's my favourite one. We were just all together. It was a really nice day. It was the 5th of March, and we've not been out for a walk together since. Which is kind of sad. I feel pretty rotten, to be honest. I, I know Robin said that, that nobody's went back as bad as they were before, but um, I don't think it would take much longer before I was back where I was. The darkness has gradually came back, the self-loathing comes back, the desire to be cut off from the world comes back. Then what happens is it gets compounded. You feel guilty that you are like that. Then you feel guilty that your family have to suffer through that. Misery doesn't like to have enjoyable surroundings. 
somebody in a, in a city living in a tenement flat might think this is paradise, but I loathe it. The only thing I want is, is a room with no windows and a door, you know, where you're just going to shut it and spend the rest of your life there. Come on, you got it, good boy. So, uh, soppy clone, 7.5s. That's for uh, take at night, sleeping. Stabazepan, 10s. These are for sleeping. When I don't take a soppy clone, take one of those, vice versa. This is Priadil, 400s. I'll take two of those at night. That's lithium. This is a mood stabiliser, apparently. So maybe people with bipolar disorder take that. The low paramide helps stop diarrhea. So I take about eight of those a day. So do you have that because of the drugs that you're taking? Yeah, possibly. Duloxetine, 60 mils. This is an antidepressant. And metazapine, 15, but I take two of these, so I take 30. You know, I want to get better. I want to feel better. I want to give to society. I want to be part of society. You know, I understand I've got a problem and I've had it for a long time and it's just like, you live, you live daily, and... Yeah. And try and hide yourself away as much as possible. Two years after the trial, Roz has arranged for additional reintegration therapy for Andy to make sense of some of the visions he had during his high dose. I was just locked into this belief that my father tried to expose me when I was an infant. And yeah, great, that's, that's why I've been depressed all my life. So it was kind of a, a convenience for me mm -hmm. to be able to blame my depression on that. Yeah. Um, but in reality, I think that was quite simplistic. And I think you helped me, well, I know you helped me almost turn that on its head. You've introduced a rationale that I can view the whole experience with a new pair of eyes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the chances of Dad actually doing that are pretty remote. He doesn't stack up with anything because it would have been something that Mum would have written in her memoirs, which is what I've got. You know, she yeah. would have. She would have definitely written something there. That, that, mm -hmm. Do you realise your dad did this? Um, it, it's really, really good because I'm not thinking, was it dad? Wasn't it dad? You know, if it was dad, why did he do it? Because I thought he loved me, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's that 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 thought loop has has gone. I can't thank you enough, Mark, you yeah. know, for what you've done. It um, it has been pretty much life changing. So mm -hmm. you know, it really. Really, really appreciate it. We'll be in touch, Andrew. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. How was that? It was good. Yeah, I think um, it was a, a good summary of what, of what uh, Andrew has been going through, but also a good example of how this integration process works. In terms of the smothering, do you think that he would experience it all differently now? I think that, that one of the key aspects of the integration process with Andrew was to take some of the pressure out of having to find a definite answer of was it a true memory or is it something that I, my mind just made up. In the event itself, what he saw is not that his father was smothering him, is that that actually became a symbolical representation of uh, his whole childhood in which it looked like uh, his mother was trying to present his father as a bad figure.
There were three parts to Andy's high day session. The first was about feeling unwanted by his father as a baby. The second was about feeling criticised and controlled by his mother as a child. And the third was more about a healthy adult position of feeling compassion and love and acceptance and understanding. After the high day session, Andy went back to that early place of, of wounding, feeling unwanted by his father. He then, with Mark's help and integration, has been able to progress forward and start focusing more on his feelings around his mother and the, the criticism and control of his childhood. And we hope that with a bit of time and more work, he'll be able to progress forward to that third stage he did experience, which was more about the acceptance and love for himself and for his parents. The wonderful thing about this treatment is that it's able to take you on this journey in the space of a day, actually, with the integration afterwards, whereas antidepressants could never do that. Antidepressants don't give you any insight as to why you're depressed. And once you know why you're depressed, you know what it is inside, then there's a possibility of processing it and actually potentially getting better. Psychedelic therapy is not pharmacological therapy. It's not that we're going to have an experience and then the depression is going to be gone. The task of bridging what we learn in the psychedelic experience into changes that actually have an influence in our physical and daily life, that is the, the part that is, for me, extremely important. And, and how to do that is something that we still don't really know. And I think that this is where the challenges for the next years in, in psychotherapy come. it's done, slightly exhausted, um, pleased it went so well, uh, on the other hand a little frustrated that the fact that we can't deliver this treatment, you know, when people need it, and just being here in central London and it being so busy, you know, they say one in ten people are suffering from depression, that's likely a few people around us right now, it's a massive problem. So what are the results look like? Andy, Mark and John, Andy and John showed quite a good initial response, um, especially John, but then they dipped back, so on average they weren't the best responders. But if you take the whole group at three weeks, roughly half were in remission, meaning essentially they're depression free. That's after on average about 18 years of depression. Uh, six months, six are still depression free, so it's quite promising really. And are there any depression free sort of two years later? Sort of like now? Yeah, yeah, there are, yeah. Some people's lives have just been transformed. It suggests that the treatment seems to work at least as well as conventional treatments. What we want to do next is compare it against conventional treatments. We need bigger trials, more rigorously designed trials, double blind, randomized control trials. Uh, and fortunately, that's happening now. So a few teams around the world are uh, running these studies, major investments coming in as a multi-site trial across Europe and the US and Canada, 15 different countries. So for things to be you know, expanding to the scale that they are right now is really exciting. That is definitely one. Speaking to guys on the trial afterwards, they said, yeah, probably if you'd had a stronger dose or a third dose, you would have had, you know, a breakthrough. But I'd, I don't know if I can risk going, picking a load of these and sitting in my bedroom, tripping my nuts off and going, ah, I've got no support. I don't, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I did feel as though I failed. I failed the test. So did it not work at all? I mean, obviously I experienced a major amount of weirdness, but it opened up a lot of questions about my, um, like my illness, but it never, never really kind of pointed me in the right direction of any answers. And maybe there aren't any answers. And that's just something I've got to deal with.
So how's your dad been in the last couple of months? Well, in the past couple of months, he's not been as good as he was before, but he's still the same person as he was four or five years ago before. Um, and we just saw that same person again a few months back. So it was nice, but it would be better if they would do it again. So that it would be nice to have them back again. Do you believe in psilocybin? Oh yeah, because uh, I've seen what, what it's done and uh, it worked like a miracle really. Uh, we never thought it would, it would be like that again and then he took the trial and it was great. Yeah, it was, it was really good. A few months after the trial, Dad was really good and it was really good to see him happy and the rest of us happy. I think it made him feel happy that everyone else was happy as well. But I don't think it was a bad thing that we saw it. Like, it was nice to see it. But, and their memories that we're all gonna keep forever. It's like, it's better seeing those memories than not having them. Every week, thousands of people who could benefit from interventions with these drugs are denied access. And that means they will continue with their depressions and their addictions. That is outrageous. It, there is no need to limit access of these drugs for medical research, but the current regulations make it almost impossible for anyone to use them clinically. In some respects, it's worse than before. I know there's something out here that will help. Uh, this the frustration that I can't really uh, make, take full advantage of that. Who's benefiting from that? Well, I'm not benefiting because I'm not getting treatment. My children don't benefit because I'm not working and showing them what a proper father and a proper person should be doing with their life to be a productive part of society. Other people who need help don't benefit because money's been spent on me when I could be back at work. Do you want me to do the poultry at the top? Yeah, I'm not going up there when there's a billy goat up. <laughs> mm -hmm.